Some people now have two screens. On one of those screens, I'm, I'm seeing who is connecting through Facebook and who is connecting through Hangouts on the other one. And I'm telling the people on Facebook to come to our Google Hangout, right? But this is, uh, I don't know if we did this before, but this is one of the first times that we broadcast simultaneously on YouTube. But how you can do on Facebook? Hmm? How you can broadcast on Facebook? If you enter Facebook, you just uh, watch it. You just uh, on Facebook, it's very easy. You just go live. I can't see anything in the group. Is the screen there or, or what? <clears throat> yes, people are watching on Facebook now. For instance, Bianca Semenyuk, your colleague, or Alina Vasiliu, they are watching on Facebook. And we're in both at the same time. Bianca Semenyuk says hello on Facebook. I can't see. But Bianca Semenyuk should join our Hangout. I sent her the link again. There are also three people watching on YouTube. <laughs> Livia Mihalaki is watching on YouTube. So we have people on Hangouts, on YouTube, on Facebook, and they do not want to join our Hangout. Livia Mihalaki. And Bianca Semenyuk, please join our Hangout, our Google Hangout. You've got the link on Facebook, on the Facebook group.
By the way, Romulus, did you see that you have a colleague that um, we didn't know of? Her name is um, Pe Pe Petra Petruzza or something. Petruzza, uh, yes. You you send a comment about her. But I don't know what to tell. She, she needs our help because she has very high ambitions. She, she wants to pass two different master programs and have a full-time job outside of Suchava. And she also says that she needs to take care of her home, that she is smart. Yes, it's like Wonder Woman. Yes. And, um, and, and she needs to pass our course without attending a single lecture or seminar. It's the first time I hear this name is a colleague with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So she she has not attended the other classes either. Any classes. How about Claudio, Brother Tsang? I is can't he, see him. Is he coming or not? Maybe we I connect don't... it a little bit early today. It's because of these tests that we are doing on Facebook, on, on YouTube. I talked with him uh, early this morning. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, w one thing that happens is that on Facebook, <clears throat> when I broadcast on Facebook, it's a little late. No, th the problem is that they cannot see you. Yes, yes, yes. I have to comment. I, are you are you watching on Facebook too? No. I, are you watching the live transmission on Facebook? Can you see yes, the Facebook live? A little late. Good. I think we have to end the live video on Facebook because it's just a test. But if people keep connecting there, it is not good. I will end the video on on, on Facebook and we continue hangouts. Flavius Krim joined the Facebook too. Valentina Bohatiric joined Facebook. People like joining Facebook. I don't know why they don't join the Google Hangout. Five people watching on YouTube. So let's close the, the Facebook connection. It was a test. For some people, the Facebook thing, it works, it works better, you know, like uh, it's more, they are in a mobile phone and they just receive a message. Someone is live on Facebook and they just uh, connect. It's not like uh, YouTube. On YouTube, you can be um, subscribed to the channel and then you can activate notifications for and in this case probably tells you when there is a new live uh, broadcast but uh, very few people uh, do that subscribe and activate notifications ruslana just joined hi ruslana 
our best uh, student in Chernitsi, defender of Ukraine 2018. You remember Romulus? Yes, yes. Ruslana, we have appointed her defender of Ukraine. And by, by the way, uh, you know, Ruslana, that in this course, in this uh, Jamonet Open Online course, uh, we already have 80 uh, students registered in the course, 80. But uh, you, you know, Romulus, how many I wanted to have? I don't know. I wanted to have 100. Do you know why? Because I want to have my Sotnia. It would be my Sotnia. Do you, do you know what a Sotnia is? 100 people. Hmm? Sotnia, yes. It's the, you know, the Cossacks. Cossacks. Uh, yeah. Yes. They, they, they organized like that. Also the Romans. Uh, they had the centur centurions, right? The Romans, but yeah, yeah, yeah. the Cossacks they had Sotnias, right? And uh, when Volodymyr uh, Parasyuk came to Maidan and talked to the people and said that he uh, would not allow uh, Yanukovych to stay in power one more day, is that if he did not resign, they would enter with uh, armed uh, uh, forces in the in the palace to take him out he said that he was there with his sotnia and he, it seems that this term sotnia is a term uh, very popular now because it's uh, all the nationalist uh, ukrainian things they are popular now right when the Soviets they 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 entered the uh, in Ukraine and they eliminated this expression probably from the army Sotnia this organization yes so you need a, a little army yeah <laughs> a Sotnia is one hundred it's like a it's a company uh, in normal terms for infantry squadron for cavalry or for but it's a uh, they like this name because it's like the cossacks uh, name right and now those who rule ukraine they they use the nationalism to try to mobilize people right and they bring all these new uh, all these terms these old terms they look very good right and I remember Parasyuk. Parasyuk also used this term, Sotnia. And we almost have a Sotnia because we have 80 students in this course, right? But uh, in fact, uh, some of those students do not participate very much. What do you think, Ruslana? Mm, about what? About uh, the students that we have in the course, some of them they have registered, but they do not participate very much. Mm. If uh, they don't pass uh, exam test, we shouldn't give them certificate about finishing this course. Aha! Uh -huh. Yes, I think that would be a good idea. And then in the end, we can realize how many do we really have, right? So yes. maybe instead of 80, maybe we have uh, 30 or 40. It could be. And in this case, Ruslana, it would not be a Sotnia. Do you know what it would be? It would be a Chot. Mm -hmm. Do you know what a Chot is? You know the difference between Sotnia and Chot, right? <coughs> Chot is a uh, half of Sotnia. Yes, half or, or one, one third of a Sotnia. Yes, or it's, it's something smaller than a Sotnia. It's a Chot. Yes? 
if you have a sotnia, you usually, Romulus, you need to be like a captain and you have a sotnia. And if you <laughs> have a shot, you are a lieutenant. Yes? But they are even smaller. Today, <laughs> what we have uh, here, Ruslana, in this uh, online thing and the people who are watching us on, there's seven connections on YouTube at the moment. That is very good. Alina Vasilio says hello, Lydia Michalake, Olga, uh, and um, Bianca, they are on YouTube. They can join our Google Hangout. I will share my the link here on, on YouTube too. So we have Sotnia, we have Chot, but what we have here today is just uh, seven people on uh, YouTube and three people on Google Hangouts. In total, 10 people. What's the name for this, Ruslana? I don't know. You do not know Ukrainian. This is what I learned in my Ukrainian classes. It's called Ri. Uh -huh. Right? Yes. So we have Sotnia, we have Chot, and we have Ri. And we have. It's not this. This is the This Sotnia, Chot, and Ri. Sotnia, 100. It means literally 100, Sotnia. Right? Then we have Chot, which means count. Right? And it's, it, it's the divisions of a Sotnia in Chot. And then we have Ri which is even smaller, right? So a chot is divided in ri. Right. What does ri mean? Something about the bees or something? Yes. What does it mean? Um, it mean, um, <laughs> amount of bees. bees. It's um, a, group, a group of bees, right? Yes. So you are like a bee, Ruslana. The defender of Ukraine needs to work like a bee, right? Right. But it's very difficult that you have important projects, right? Important European projects, if you do not even have a sot near. <coughs> you understand? They They... If you, if you just have a re, they do not give you like so much money from the European Union just for a re. Right? Yes. If you have a shot, they can give you a little bit more. But if you have a sotnia, then it's something more important. Okay, so let's uh, start with today's topic. I put you in mute. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to a new lecture within our Jamone Open Online course of European Integration, which this year is focused on strategic communications. As you know, this Jamone Open Online course is part of a Jamone Chair in European Political Economy at Alexandru Yankuza University of Yash. And it is co-funded by the European Union through the Erasmus Plus program, which is the European Union's Education, Youth and Sports program. We always say who co-funds our courses at the start because of gratitude, acknowledgement of this uh, financial assistance, but also because of 
transparency in order to avoid any conflict of interest. Today's topic is a really hot topic because today we will discuss data protection and the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. It's a very long name, but you can say just GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Data protection has always been important for everyone. If you run a company, if you have some invention and you need to protect your invention from a, a industrial theft from other, from other companies, uh, if you are Ruslana and you are a very good student and you are writing your exam, and you do not want the other students to copy from you in the exam and you need to protect your exam or if you <clears throat> are in the military and you have some strategy or some tactical moves prepared and you want the enemy not to know them but this also applies to football players they train uh, certain uh, certain games beforehand and they do not want the other teams to know about them. They don't even know them to know who the players will actually be in a particular match. But the data protection in our context is important because um, <coughs> personal data it's very important for strategic communications. Strategic communications, we mentioned from the start, that it's communications intended to modify, to alter the behavior of a target audience. And in order to uh, modify the behavior of a target audience, it is very helpful to have information about that target audience to have this kind of targeted strategic communications. So it's like in, in advertising, we use the term targeted advertising. And if you uh, watch YouTube, if you uh, use Facebook, or you just browse the net, you will see probably advertisements that are especially related to your own behavior and, and probably to your needs. So if, I, if it's on Christmas and I have two children, I probably have advertis, uh, advertisements about toys, for me to buy toys in Christmas. If you are um, a, a fan of video games, probably you will have advertisements about uh, video games. If you are uh, in hospital or something, and maybe you get advertisements about medicine. So this is called targeted advertising. And uh, this idea of data protection and its relation to strategic communications came to the forefront with the United States Trump campaign. Because this campaign, they, you probably have heard about Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica was a British firm that uh, collected data from Facebook, from Facebook users and from the friends of Facebook users, collected data supposedly to do some kind of um, scientific uh, research with those data. Carmen Nastasi say Merry Christmas. I just sent her the link then to our Hangout. So that she can say Merry Christmas live with us. Carmen Nastasi, the Dean of the Faculty of Economics in Suchava. So with the Trump campaign, Cambridge Analytica collected data from users uh, from users' behavior, but also from users' attitude to try to target the 
political campaign to those users that would be more susceptible to that. So they, they something they mention sometimes, the, the, that the people who watch The Walking Dead were people who were most uh, worried about immigration, right? So they uh, put advertisements about the walking, uh, about immigration of the Trump campaign in the show of The Walking Dead on television, yes? But they did this also on Facebook, because on Facebook, it's much easier to do targeted advertising. If you want to do targeted advertising on television, yes, you can know that the people who watch a particular show, a particular series, they are susceptible to certain topics and you can adapt the message to those people. But this is just for broad groups of people and you are considering all the watchers of The Walking Dead as having the same preferences. It's already an advance to know who watches The Walking Dead and to know which kind of uh, strategic uh, communication you need to use with them. But with Facebook, you can uh, do targeted advertising on a personal basis. Because Facebook and the internet, they can show individual content to people. They can show different ads to different people based on their personal characteristics, not based on the group of people who watch a particular show. The, the results of the elections in the, in the US were contested and there were accusations of Russian uh, propaganda influence on the elections and there were accusations of using personal uh, data uh, uh, illegally collecting those data without people knowing what data they were collecting, collecting data from friends and colleagues. And uh, the results of the elections were contested. In the case of Brexit, it was something similar. The Brexit campaign, those who uh, supported leave, leaving the European Union, they were um, accused of uh, using also this kind of strategic communication techniques that are on the border of illegality, like uh, not respecting uh, individual um, privacy, individual data, like stealing personal information, and then e using it to manip manipulate people in a certain direction, which is strategic uh, communication. Well, the GDPR, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, comes in this context. So sometimes when the, the, the climate was right for such kind of regulation, because it was the moment when the topic was hot and when people would, were more sensitized about the problem of data protection and when it was easier then for them to support this new legislation. The EU's general data protection regulation is a very advanced uh, uh, data protection regulation in the world. If you compare it with regulations in other uh, parts of the world, in the US or, or in, in China or in Russia or in other important regions of the world, the GDPR has been like... A, a pioneer in a sense or much more stringent, much more demanding with companies. And probably you remember that when the GDPR came into force, you received probably many emails from companies that said, we have uh, your personal data on our files and uh, when we collected those data at that moment, the GDPR was not yet in force. You, you did not give us consent 
to keep your data if you want them uh, to if you want us to keep those data then you have to allow us and if you do not reply to this email then we will have to delete your data it's probably romulus you receive a you receive those emails, right, Romulus? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. It was when GDPR came into force, right, in the spring. Yes, yes. Of... I received many, many emails about the GDPR, but uh, I'm not sure the companies know really what the GDPR is. Mm -hmm. It is just phishing. Mm -hmm. We will discuss this now, but the important thing is that you have heard about GDPR, yes. you have received those emails. And After 25 May, uh, I received many emails about it. Many emails like that. Okay. Probably the people who are watching us on YouTube, they have also received those emails. Bianca Semenyuk, Lydia Mihalake, all have. Alina Vasiliu, Flavius, uh, probably they have received the ICAN right on YouTube and tell us their experience with GDPR. <clears throat> but GDPR is much more than that. GDPR forces companies that have personal data about people to have a right to have those data, to have those data because you have allowed them to have those data. So that's why Romulus, they sent you emails to ask for your permission to keep your data. If you don't give express permission, they should delete those data from their files. In fact, uh, this is already uh, something serious for some companies because those companies that do not respect GDPR can be fined. And the fines can be up to 4% of the business value of the company, 4% of the, of the uh, income of the company, of the turnover of the company. And uh, imagine for a big uh, multinational like Facebook or like Google, if you are fined with a fine up to 4% of your business, then it's a, a very big fine. But GDPR, of course, does not apply to all kinds of firms or organizations. For instance, hospitals, they have your private, your very personal data, and they didn't send you emails asking you for permission to keep those data. The police, not the Ukrainian police, those have a lot of data maybe about you, but the police in general in all our countries, in Romania, in Spain, in, in Germany, in France, they have lots of data about you, but they do not need to comply with GDPR, the government in general those who make the gdpr they do not have to comply themselves with gdpr right so so this can be already a source of controversy right even the schools even journalists they do not need to comply with gdpr so certain exceptions to the rule so you when you have a very stringent very demanding rule for everyone but some groups are excluded from application of the rule which in a sense is it's normal because imagine if you are a criminal and you have a criminal record and you cannot invoke gdpr to tell them you should delete all my personal data right good <clears throat> mm, gdpr gives you a access to the data that companies have about you you have a right to in case you do not trust a certain company that they have deleted the data that they had about you or in case 
uh, they have not contacted you to ask for your permission, you can ask a company to show all the data they have about you. This is the right of access. And you also have an, another important uh, um, right, which is the right to be forgotten. So you can ask them to delete any data they have about you. In some cases, talking with my colleagues who are experts on GDPR and who work at universities trying to adapt their systems to the needs of GDPR, and they tell that sometimes there are curious situations. For instance, there are students at universities who ask, I want my personal uh, data to be deleted from the system. And the university, of course, says we cannot uh, do that because, you know, because of the exams that you passed at this university, on the basis of that, we gave you a publicly valid diploma that says that you are a doctor. And with that diploma, you can work anywhere and so on. And if someone contests that you are a real doctor or not, we need to be able to show that you have passed your exams with us. So it's not possible for you to ask for the results of your exams to be deleted from the system because in that sense, it's like something similar to the police or to government, right? That, but on other cases, yes, you can, for, for instance, if you had a Facebook account, you no longer want to work with Facebook, you don't no longer like Facebook, and you ask for Facebook to delete your uh, data, and to close your account and to forget you, to write to be forgotten. Good. This thing about uh, uh, the application of GDPR, we said that. Uh, ah, that Can I tell you something? Yes. This oh. is only in Europe. The Americans ban Europe clients. Uh, on their sites. Uh, the big journals bans clients from Europe uh, and other companies because in uh, USA, GDPR don't apply. Mm -hmm. Yes, G GDPR is something that applies in Europe, right? And, and um, what happens sometimes, you know, the European Union is a very large, organization and very powerful economically in the world. So multinational companies that operate in the European Union, they need to comply with GDPR for the customers that they have in Europe, not for the ones that they have in Malaysia or in Russia or in the US. But what happens is that many companies once they have to change the regulations for a very large part of the world, they already change it for the whole world, right? So for instance, Facebook, when GDPR came into force and they said that they would apply GDPR not only to their European uh, customers, but also worldwide to everyone. They would apply the principles of GDPR worldwide. There's a discussion about this, about the effect of regulation and the competition of different uh, territories with regulation. Probably, I don't know if you, Claudio, you have heard about uh, Delaware. Have you heard about Delaware, Claudio? Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, I heard about Delaware, but uh, I don't remember exactly. You know, Del Delaware is a, is a state in the U.S. Oh, yeah, of course. That uh, has a very, um, very lax regulation, right? That regulates firms very little, has low taxes, 
and has low regulation in the US. So many firms, many American firms establish themselves in Delaware to pay less taxes and to have less uh, stringent regulations. And this is called the Delaware effect. The effect that when there's some country or some state or some region that has lower regulation, lower standards, yeah. then it attracts firms that want to go to the place where they have lower standards. This is called the Delaware effect. But what happens, uh, Claudio and Romulus, is that there's also another effect that it's called the California effect. In the US, this, the state of California is the opposite to Delaware. In California, they have very high standards. Very regulation is, is, is on a higher level, higher standards. And for instance, if you see for cars, they need to have green stickers, they need to be less uh, pollutant. They, in general, regulation is, uh, is higher in, in California. And some uh, analysts, some, some authors, they have recognized that in some cases there are also the so-called California effect, which means that when California uh, creates a new regulation that is more stringent and they produce, for instance, cars for the whole United States, but because California is very important economically inside the United States and they want to be able to sell also in California, they need to adapt the standards of their cars for the whole country just to be able to sell also in California because they do not make different cars for California and for the rest of the country. And this is called the California effect, right? So it's true what uh, Romulus just mentioned that GDPR does not apply um, to the US, it applies to the EU, but in some cases this so-called California effect makes that some companies that have some business globally and they cannot uh, do it differently in different parts of the world and they just decide to upgrade their standards worldwide right and the case of facebook because also the scandal of facebook in cambridge analytica was very recent when gdpr came into force and they said that they were very sorry about what happened and so on, and as a proof of that, and they said that the GDPR, they would apply it globally, for instance, Facebook, and like that, many other companies. But also, you probably will see differences when you uh, <coughs> browse the internet and you enter a website and, and there's a pop-up and saying, we, care about your privacy, we need your consent to use cookies on this website, uh, please accept the uh, cookies. And this happens only in Europe. And I don't know your experience, I would like to ask you if you really read that or you just, you just, you know, it's like a waste of time and you just have to click accept on everyone. Claudio, what do you do? When you browse the net, you enter a website and they pop you up with your privacy, cookies and so on. You just click accept or you just start reading everything, all the detail and... If the website is important for me, I, uh, I accept uh, the condition and uh, move on because <coughs> It's quite a one-way uh, ticket. You accept or you don't accept. So, well, but GDPR, it's a difference now in GDPR as it used to be before. It means that GDPR forces companies not to give you a choice, just accept or leave. Right? Companies now are forced to give you much more detailed choice. 
So for instance, companies are forced to tell you why they need to use cookies for the website, what they use them for, and which of those cookies are indispensable and which ones you can opt out from them, right? So in theory, a company that complies with GDPR correctly, it sends you a pop-up and it tells you, we use cookies for this, we use these different kinds of cookies, and uh, these cookies are indispensable. If you reject these cookies, you cannot use the service because it's in impossible for us to, to give you the service. But there are these other cookies that you can decide whether you opt in or opt out. From them. And this is something that people, I don't know, when you browse the net very much, you do not have time to read the detail about those things and you just accept the default option all the time. And I, I just wanted to know your experience. How about you, Romulus? My experience is that if I don't have the chance to to close the, the pop-up, I don't go further. I, I uh, just uh, quit the, the website. Because uh, if they force me to accept cookies, I don't read uh, this site anymore. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> now another question for discussion. What do you think the influence of this can be? Because you said that some, in this case, like uh, <clears throat> this regulation that uh, forces them to to um, give you this uh, pop up this sh this offer to um, accept or not and <clears throat> if you are forced to answer then you don't like the yes. website right yes i close the website yes do you think that if this applies to european companies or companies doing business in Europe and not in the US that this regulation in the end has an effect to, to um, as an obstacle to the development of the internet because maybe there are many people like you who just because of this pop-up they just don't go to a website whereas when they go to an American website or they are in America and they just don't see that, and they just... Yes. The First of all, I, I hate pop-ups. When, when GDPR appears, uh, many websites uh, close the, the page you access with this uh, pop-up. And this is uh, frustrating for me. This, if, uh, if I don't have the option to close this pop-up, I don't go further. For me, is garbage. Mm -hmm. If they can uh, have GDPR without this enormous pop-up, I don't read them. Mm -hmm. How is it in, in Ukraine, Ruslana? Because Ukraine is outside the EU and it's not uh, bound by GDPR. In, in Ukraine, when you visit websites, you have pop-ups all the time uh, about GDPR? Uh, yes, uh, oh, sometimes we have, but sometimes not. Uh, it depends on the site. But uh, personally, when uh, I see something like that, I just click accept or agree, and I don't read. Exactly, agree, just to be able to go on, right? Yes. Good, good. So, yes, I think the, the EU legislators, they try to, to offer people a choice, right? To offer people a real choice, not just to, to have an obstacle for people and just asking them to close pop-ups all the time. They wanted to offer a real choice, but it's not sure if they have achieved the, this or not. But my question now for you, 
It's why do you think that GDPR came in the European Union and not in the US? Because uh, Romulus says the GDPR applies in the EU, but not in the US. Why was it not the US that came first with this idea, with such kind of regulation? Why do you think that the EU are pioneers in this uh, field of GDPR? Data protection, Romulus. Why do you think that the European Union is a leader in protecting the rights of internet users compared because to Google Facebook? and Facebook don't have this their uh, they HR here in Europe and they use many of uh, data from Europeans to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. So, and if the regulation yeah. applies in USA, they have problems, Facebook or Google. They have to rethink uh, the entire uh, business. So you think it's because uh, Facebook or Google are, or Microsoft, right? Yes, are based in USA. Are American companies. Yes, yes. Right? And, and, and here it's a question about protecting consumers against producers right yes and in the us they also have consumers right but um, they also have the producers and those producers google uh, and uh, facebook uh, microsoft they produce for for the whole uh, for the whole world right they export from america to other countries. So ap applying regulations to them would be a little bit of a, of a problem, right? To, to, because on the one hand, yes, you protect American consumers, but on the other hand, you can uh, create obstacles for American producers worldwide. So that's why the EU, because the EU does not have an industry like uh, Google, Facebook, or Microsoft to compete with the US. And that's why here the perspective of consumers has, uh, has a greater weight in this field of data protection than in the US. So this may be an explanation. I think... Um, <clears throat> I have now, I, I just heard that I, I, they are giving, giving me something, uh, the, the postman or something, just knock on the door. Maybe I will have to go or not. My children are at home. If they can manage themselves, it's okay. But if not, I just uh, stop the transmission for two minutes and I come back. So this was the first question. The GDPR applies in Europe, not in the US. What will be the effect of this globally? What will be the effect of this for Europe? Romulus in the beginning also mentioned that this, this could be bad for European uh, consumers because some of the American multinationals that sell also in Europe they have decided not to sell anymore in Europe. I have to go just one second. Boy. Thank you. 
Hi, again. My children are very small and they didn't want to, to give this to them. Maybe in a different occasion we will discuss about these things, about the Chinese, how they now they control the whole uh, postage uh, system in Spain, right? Because I received like a, a very small thing that cost one euro and the postman comes to my door to bring this to me from China. And I said, how is that possible? That with something that costs one euro and they send the postman to my door and she's talking with me there for a quarter of an hour. Yes, it's topic for discussion. Okay, so we were discussing the <clears throat> fact that GDPR was controversial, it applies to Europe, but not to the US. And an explanation for that can be that the great organizations such as Google, Facebook, Microsoft, that control great amount of data of people that hold the great amounts of data, they are American exporters. And if they are American exporters, it, uh, the US is also very developed in defending consumer rights, but in this case, it's a dilemma for them, right? Because they do not want to be an obstacle for a great American champion, right? Good. <clears throat> Another topic uh, 
related to, to GDPR is what we mentioned that Romulus introduced in the beginning, that may be the effect of GDPR can be something bad for European consumers. That is not clear, right? If GDPR creates greater uh, rights for consumers, for European consumers, that can be a good thing. And um, But if it just means like uh, an obstacle, like, like having to close pop-ups without reading them, or if that means that some companies will close their business in Europe, they will not offer the news in Spain or in Romania or in other countries because of the regulation, that can be negative for, for consumers. We'll see the, the result. Something also very important that I would like to mention to you, and this is something general that we have seen throughout the course, is a, the fact that the EU budget, the money in the EU, is something scarce. The EU budget is a very small budget. We knew this, we had one topic about the budget. The budget is very small. And one of the reasons why the budget is very small is because the, the size of the EU budget, the, the um, overall uh, size of the budget needs to be approved every seven years in what are called the multi annual financial perspectives, multi-annual financial frameworks, they need to approve every seven years by unanimity. So all these member states need to agree for any increase in the spending cap for the European Union. So just one or two countries are against increasing the spending and the budget cannot grow. And that is one of the reasons why the budget is so small, because member state governments that rule the European Union, they have not agreed to give the power of spending to the European Union. They need to keep this power for them. Uh, the government of Spain, the government of Romania, of Germany, of Sweden, of uh, Hungary, they want to have themselves the power to spend on education, on health, on important uh, issues. And the EU budget is something very, very small because of that. Right? And what happens also is that for the European Union has own resources. They has its like its own taxes. For instance, it has the um, customs uh, duties it collects at the external uh, borders of, of the EU. And it also has uh, a proportion of VAT and so on. But all the regulations of the European Union, all the legislation that has to do with taxation requires unanimity. And here I will tell you also a very recent example. We tried to discuss recent topics, hot topics. The issue of the digital tax. Have you heard about the digital tax, Claudio? No, it's quite new for me. There are some governments in the EU, such as the French government, the Spanish government, that have said that they, they, they want to introduce some tax on these big American multinationals that hold personal data, right? And they said, if they hold the people's data and you use those data for business and, and these people are Europeans, we will charge you a tax. If you hold 
data from Spanish people and you sell those data and you use those data for business, we will charge you a tax. And the Spanish government that wants to increase spending in Spain and needs to have more revenue to, to be able to spend and had this idea of introducing a tax, right? <clears throat> also, the French want, are in favor of introducing such a tax. The Germans are also in favor. Many countries are in favor of introducing a tax on the use of personal data. But there is one problem, that they need unanimity for that, right? And uh, there is one country in the European Union, Ireland, that it hosts uh, this big uh, America multinational um, branches in in europe there so ireland said that they are against this digital tax and it cannot be approved at the european union level another country now that is against uh, this thing is portugal and google created just uh, created in in portugal like a big uh, center that created i don't know how many thousand jobs there in portugal and with that they already bought the vote of portugal against any of this so this is a problem with the uh, with the eu that taxation requires unanimity right and because taxation requires unanimity, it's very easy for a big multinational to buy, to bribe a small country of the European Union. They bribe the smaller countries because they are the cheaper countries to bribe. Ireland is very small. Portugal is small, right? But if not, they can choose any other. They could choose... Uh, I don't know, Malta or Greece or Cyprus or whatever, right? And this is a problem. Yes, this unanimity requirement. But this can also help us understand something, that the European Union likes using fines very much. We said that with data protection, that the EU could impose fines up to 4% of the, of the business of one company one year, yes? And this is a fine related to data protection. This is not taxation, in theory. It is a fine for something related to data protection. But it's a fine that it's of billions of euros, right? So if you want to tax the big American multinational companies, because the European Union system requires unanimity for taxation and they can block this very easily by bribing a small country in the EU to block any decision, but you can create by majority a GDPR, and as part of the GDPR, introduce fines for certain kinds of companies of certain dimension of, and for certain activities, right? Cloud, you, you drive a car? Do you have a car, Cloud, you? Yes, I have a car and a motorcycle. Have, have you ever paid the fines? For? for driving fast or for parking or for anything you ever paid oh in the past yes yes me too <laughs> everyone if you have a car sometimes it's inevitable yes, right of course. Yeah. and sometimes when you pay the 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 fines sometimes you you say wow you know they are much more strict now in this period of the year the police are controlling a lot it seems that they need money 
and yeah. they are increasing the fines, right? In the case of Spain, sometimes in some periods, the pressure of the police is so much that you say is that they receive instructions from the government to increase the number of fines. Some people they are accused of having like a commission, like they receive like a bonus if they uh, if they give more fines, right? Yes. And sometimes people say, what's the purpose of fines? It's really to deter people from behaving badly or it's just that they need money, right? And the same can happen with this kind of regulations, right? It introduces fines, but you don't really know if the purpose of those fines is really data protection, right? Or if the purpose of these fines is the money from the fines, right? The European Union also has a very important, um, <clears throat> how do you say, this the competition policy, anti antitrust policy against the monopolies. You, we mentioned this policy too. And this policy also applies very big fines to big American multinationals, such as Microsoft or Google, right? The same question applies, right? Is it because they want to protect consumers or is it because they just want to make money for the European Union? It's a lot of controversy, but I like this topic, the general data protection regulation. And um, from the point of view of individual business, the GDPR is something also controversial, right? From the point of view of individual business, because in some cases it forces you to hire lawyers, it forces you to hire um, IT professionals to adapt your systems, and it makes you spend money on something that sometimes you believe it's something like stupid, like you need to spend money to create um pop-up that people will have to spend time in closing it right and you see the gdpr as something bad and in the beginning myself i myself because we also have a website i also had the same impression i also had the impression that gdpr was something that introduced a cost on people because we needed to adapt also our systems to comply with GDPR. <clears throat> and that is something, it's a continuous process. You need to be watching all the time with new developments and to be all the time trying to comply with these regulations. And you can see this as a cost. In some cases, you could see this also as something that is a very big cost for small companies, for small business, right? Because if you are Google or Facebook and you need to comply with GDPR and you need a lawyer to write a set of regulations or a computer scientist uh, to adapt some, some of your uh, software, it is a, a cost that you will divide among many, many, many millions of customers. But if you are a small business and you need to pay a lawyer and you need to pay an IT professional to adapt your small website, this can be a much greater cost. So GDPR is something that goes mostly against big American corporations but maybe it has a side effect that for those big corporations it's easier to comply with gdpr than for smaller uh, websites what do you think uh, about uh, this uh, romulus do you think gdpr uh, is something against the big corporations and in favor of small and, and more honest players, 
or do you think that GDPR can be used by the big corporations in order to protect their market from the newcomers? Because the new business, they do not have so much experience or good lawyers, and so maybe you could use GDPR to... How do I don't know how to answer that, but, uh, it's something costly, it's clear. Uh, you have to hire a lawyer and a designer for all this uh, stuff, and you have to know how to comply to all GDPR rules. And uh, for uh, small companies, uh, it's something important. For bigger companies, it's something without so much uh, importance in their business. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to have a, an important business, you have to comply. It's clear. This is a topic for discussion. If, if, if GDPR uh, favors competition, or if GDPR is something that can be used to hinder competition. Right? If GDPR protects more business, or if GDPR is something that can be used by big business to create obstacles for action. Yes, but, but this is a product for consumers, not for companies. Yes, but it's the GDPR, this regulation, you, you, uh, the companies need to comply with it. And maybe yes. the big fish, they they can do it, but yes, the smaller yes. ones, it's more difficult for them. So imagine you, Romulus, you mentioned, when I see a pop-up on a website, I just leave the website if, if I cannot close it, right? Yes. Well, yes. you are using now Google Hangouts, right? Yes. When yes. you joined this conversation, you had a pop-up telling you that you will join a conversation. Yes. And you close it and you left or you joined? You accept I joined. I you joined. Accept it. Yes, you I accept. Because this is this Google Hangout, we, we have no alternative. We yes. just tried now to, to do an experiment with Facebook today. But we see it's not the same thing because you cannot join live on Facebook. We also always try to find competition on our website. You, you can log in with Facebook, right? Yeah. And you can log in also with Yahoo. And you can log in with Google and with LinkedIn. We try to find competition not to depend on any single provider. But still, they are all American, right? Yes. <clears throat> At some point, we also have some Russian ones. Uh, they contacted. We also had the, um, I don't know, Yandex. We also had Mailru. Yes, that you could join our website, but we we had difficulties in the end, nobody used them and we, we closed this. In addition that the, the Ukrainian nationalists, they, they have closed the Ukrainian market to Russian competition. So now it's only American corporations that are allowed to sell social media. So there's no mail in Ukraine now? Hmm? No. It's no mail? No. And no, and no they contacted, and no, no Klasniki, and no Yandex. They but it's Christmas. It's Christmas today. It's Christmas. In Ukraine. Today. In, In Ukraine. Ukraine. Hey, Ruslana, you didn't tell us that it's Christmas in Ukraine. Yes, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. Merry Christmas, Ruslana. <laughs> so is it the Orthodox Christmas or what? Um, yes, it's Orthodox Christmas, but... Um, 
Is it today or yesterday? When is that? It's today. Today, ah, it's very good. Yesterday was a very important day in Spain because it's the, the three wise men. They bring presents to children on the 6th of January. You know, the three wise men that came from, from the East and brought presents to the baby Jesus, right? And we have this tradition to give presents to children in this day on the 6th of January. It's more, more than Santa Claus or more than, yeah? Good. So it's good to have an international course, Ruslana. I'm really proud that today you are with us because it's not only that you are such a, such exotic because you are the only one from Ukraine. Also because within Ukraine you are so important. Defender of Ukraine 2018, appointed by your colleagues of the Eurosign Network. Claudio was there and he remembers that you were the only one that participated in this important seminar when we appointed you Defender of Ukraine. Good. <clears throat> so we also have uh, Mokanu that uh, just managed to join, but we cannot see him. That, do you have a camera, Mokanu? Bogdan? Bogdan I Mokanu? Don't. I do have. You have a camera? Yes, yes, I have. Hi, Bogdan Mokanu from Yak. So now, in, in the end, we have Chernitsi, Suchawa, and Yash, which is not bad. And we also have five simultaneous connections on, on YouTube. We were also broadcasting on, on Facebook at some point. Okay, so we have several topics for discussion and the final one was this that for small business for someone like me uh, it this gdpr regulation was something negative i saw it as a cost that we had to to pay but in then when you start reading it and when you start revising your website when you start uh, learning about what kind of personal data you are collecting, which of those data you really need, which of those data you don't need, or who is using those data, and you start caring about uh, people's data. And I think that is something that can bring benefits to your organization. It's not just a cost, because data protection is something important for consumers. It's important that your data as consumers are protected. But data protection is also important for business. Because if you have some data of your users, you want to protect those data not to be used by third parties that should not be allowed to use those data. And this is data protection. And this is something for the benefit of your own organization, your own consumers first, but then also your own business. As we mentioned in the start of this lecture, data protection, you need it also if you do not want to, to be spied by the competition. If you don't want the competition to steal the data from your customers. And this is data protection also. So the GDPR, which is something that starts to protect uh, individual rights of consumers in the EU, in the end, I'm not sure if it's something negative for business in Europe by creating an additional burden for those business. Maybe it can be something positive positive in the sense that it will make you care more about the data that you hold. So this is something that I ask you in the seminar discussion questions. If you think that GDPR is something positive or negative for business in Europe. Okay, 
I thank you all very much for your participation today. I don't know if you have any questions or comments, you can participate now. Bogdan, you managed to log in from home in the end or what? Uh, yes, but I was uh, commenting on <clears throat> YouTube because I watched you over there, but I couldn't connect on my phone. So uh, on, in, on, at some point I decided to log in from my laptop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the laptop is a good thing, you know. It's uh, something that uh, we could discuss sometime uh, in the seminars, maybe, that many people, they uh, are used to going to class, going to school, right? And they go to school and they sit there and they dress well and they are with the teacher and that is something important. But when they have an online class, right, they just think, oh, I will connect from my mobile phone while I am in the gym or while I am in, with my motorbike in the countryside driving and I connect to the class from my mobile phone because it is online and if it's online it means it's a joke it's not something important right and it's something that you should understand that a class a lecture is a lecture independently whether it is offered in the classroom or if it's offered online and it is not so much to ask from people to connect from a laptop computer yes and to be in a room and to close the door and not to be disturbed by anyone while they are doing the um, the class but i understand the difficulty you know because the the um, important changes going on nowadays in the world in the way we communicate and in the world of education also Right? If you see Harvard, HBX, HBX, probably you have heard about it, is Harvard Business School that has online courses. And HBX, it's something similar to what we do, right? The only difference is that they do it, wow, on a larger scale because they have like a studio tv studio from where the teacher connects is not the teacher just with a webcam and a computer it's just a whole studio and the teacher can walk around and can uh, use different media and they are like a TV, tv directors television directors controlling everything but people when they connect to harvard business school online from India, from South Africa, from Spain, from Korea, from Brazil, they are sitting in front of a computer at the time of the class, right? And here in our system, we have been more, what do you think, Claudio? You think that we are very flexible, too flexible with our classes or not? To be flexible is quite good. It's good, but do you think that it's okay for people to connect with a mobile phone or not? Maybe it's something that we need to accept uh, in the future, that people connect to classes from a mobile phone while they are in the train. At the time of the class, they are on a train. Uh, it uh, is important to participate, not the way how they participate on yes the... but if you are in a train yeah there is noise and you cannot concentrate i think that uh, is depending uh, uh, for each one how to manage the environmental things and uh, i think um, that everyone can uh, can be part, uh, can be a, part, a member of the of the class uh, without um, any restriction about the, the how uh, they do 
this this, this thing. So you, you think we should be open to yes, uh, sure. different options of how people connect, right? That's for sure, yeah. And we should be in line with new developments in technology and with the fact that people use mobiles more and more that some people don't even have a computer anymore. They just use the mobile phone for everything, right? Yes. Yes, I, sometimes I think that, you know, that we have to, to go with the times. But other times I get worried, right? Then when people tell me, I cannot uh, connect because I, I am uh, in the train going I don't know where. But how come you are going in the train at the time when you have the class? Right? And you give me that as an excuse. That's no excuse. If you want to participate, you will find uh, the way. But uh, the, the, the question, you know, I, I, it's a dilemma for me too. And I thank you all very much for participating today and for the nice discussion that we had about GDPR. And next week, next Monday, at 11.30 Eastern European time, we will have a new lecture that will be the last lecture in this course for this year. And in this lecture, we will discuss a really, really important topic, a surprise topic, that will be the topic of my new project in the future. Until next week, until Monday, thank you all very much again for your participation. And bye-bye.